Gontarov. <laughs> Gontrov is a romantic noir mafia film produced by Martin Scorsese and directed by Matteo. It was released in 1973 on the festival circuit. It was shot on location in Nepal, Italy, and stars Robert De Niro as Russian mafia man and title character Gontrov, and Sybil Shepard as his character's wife Katya, stars Harvey Cattell as Andre, and Sophia Lauren as Sophia. It was praised for its fresh, introspective take and its willingness to push the boundaries of the traditional mobster film. It was nominated for several awards, including the 26th Annual Cannes Film Festival Grand Prix, which it narrowly missed out on, to The Scarecrow by Jerry Schatzberg. However, between budget constraints and the growing tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, the film never made a wide theatrical release and was mostly buried. It was actually considered lost media for a really long time, with a lot of people claiming to have found copies in their basement, but no one ever saw one, and it was very weird about whether or not it really existed or not, until about 2020 when someone posted like a piece of weird off-brand merch and the internet did its thing, and by November of 2022, a copy had resurfaced. The rest is history. Now it has returned. We are in a Goncharov renaissance. The prodigal son hath returneth. It's a lovely, it's a lovely time to be alive. It is not currently on any streaming platforms. And because my last video got copy striked to death, I am not going to be including clips of the film in this video. I am sorry deal with it we're taking a page out of carrie can read's book and we're just going to use some fan art <laughs> because uh, i can credit those people and they won't take my video down oh this has nothing to do with this video by the way it has nothing to do with any video actually it's all me so mafia films mafia films mafia films are full of themes of rags to riches self-reliance and individualism like cinderella with guns instead of mice they have a long history of being immigrant stories as well, for better or worse, for representation, and have long since allowed audiences to live vicariously in a world much like my own Thanksgiving, where danger persists and violence is an acceptable form of communication. They are video games for people with bad hand-eye coordination, and romance films for people whose fathers responded to I love you with thank you. In Wallace Katz's Sticking Together or Falling Apart, The Sopranos, an American Moral Order, he claims that the films attract audiences because they allow us to recall and understand some important aspect of our collective American and or ethnic immigrant past. America the Beautiful, a nation built on ocean pollution, indentured servitude, and tax evasion. Older mafia films tended to remain sort of moralistic and distancing in the light of the Great Depression. They sort of vilified the immigrant for abusing the system with violence and greed, and also gave, you know, audiences a way to live vicariously in this world of wealth and excess and freedom. They are escapism, and as time goes on, they become more and more morally ambiguous, focusing less on the wealth and riches and more on the motivations behind the characters. As we near the 20th century, the films start to focus not on the initial mafia family's climb to the top, but on the product of that climb, on the second generation, on the children of the first mafia families. This is where Scorsese comes into play. Martin Scorsese is the king of this genre, of the, the American immigrant mafia kid film. <laughs> So to make an English language film set in Italy with Russian characters and a multi-ethnic cast so early in Scorsese's career was a pretty big deal. It was a powerful move, and if the Goncharov renaissance that we're experiencing now says anything, then it was a smart move, and it was a good one. He took the all-American, American-specific immigrant story, that theme, and made it universal. He took it out of the United States so that Americans can look at these characters and look at these stories as American stories happening to non-Americans. He made them universal stories, showing that man is always after the same things. Family, unity, success, and the desperate, desperate attempts to stave off loneliness. Unfortunately, his humanization of the characters is probably what contributed to the general squashing of the film. After all, we are peak Soviet Union, and, and that, we, that Cold War is really, really chilling down, right? That Cold War is getting colder by the day. 
The film also oozes confidence. This oozes confidence like a 10-year-old playing Fortnite. Like a 10-year-old playing Fortnite and building very quickly ramps and walls so that you can go over or your enemies can quickly put up defenses to keep them from shooting you. It's super frustrating and I shake in my boots when somebody starts building at me. It oozes confidence. It sweats it. It's dripping in confidence, okay? Goncharov is a Greek tragedy, and it tells you right off the bat exactly what's gonna happen and how it's gonna happen. Goncharov and Andre, two mafia men, having an intense mafia discussion in a very cool, like, forest green, dark wood, big drapey curtain parlor with, like, ornate desks and, and like, a big clock and art and, and I can't use clips of the film I'm trying to describe it for you to set the mood there's long curtains it's beautiful it's got it, it, they've got whiskey glasses that look like they should be on scandal or in Robert Duvall's office in Newsies it's beautiful it's a beautiful set there's soft music in the background which we'll get to and they're having this discussion and the clock on the wall starts to chime and Gontrov is like bro that clock is a couple of minutes off and Andre is like that's your problem bro you are too confident in your own senses. Which, if that's not, you're gonna fuck your mom and kill your dad, I don't know what is. He doesn't even confirm if the clock is actually off or not. He just lets it sit. He just lets it sit. He just says, mm, he could be right. What if, he might be right. It doesn't matter if he's right. The point isn't if he's right. The point is that he thinks he's right. Because Goncharov is cocky. He is confident. He is desperate for a self made independent island of success. And this theme of self-reliance is going to come up again and again and again. And it is the crux of who Goncharov is. Having lost his family, tortured by loneliness, he sets off to be an island, to rely on no one, to be the one lone wolf in the forest or whatever he says. And it's a little bit in line with these transcendentalist individualist ideologies. Those put forth by authors like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who in his essays on self-reliance <laughs> says, the only person you are destined to become is the person you decide to be. Or Henry David Thoreau, who writes, cultivate poverty like a garden herb, like sage. Do not trouble yourself to get the new things, whether clothes or, hold on, hold on. Oh shit, sorry, American capitalist individualism, my bad. It's like he heard Henry D David Thoreau say, I have as it were my own sun and moon and stars and a little world all unto myself and stopped there. A man who refuses to see the world for anything other than what he wishes it to be with this false sense of idealism who sees the world as nothing but a concept that he can bend and mold into whatever shape he wants it to be. The false promise of a political and economic individualism that permeates the American dream and the mafia lifestyle that says that with enough brute force and quick wit, man can rule the world. And it's this particular brand of individualism, this like slightly solipsistic, objectivist take that paved the way for hustle culture and Mr. Beast. It's that that individualism that like a toxic gas leaking through the vents of the films where characters live in these, these false realities engineered for them by a society that values usefulness over humanity. Gontrov itself is a radical assessment of the ways in which love and denial fight and claw and tear at each other like two cartoon animals fighting for dominance over the human condition and desperately trying to break the chain that the other has so carefully placed around the neck of humanity. When we are unhurried and wise, we perceive that only great and worthy things have any permanent and absolute existence, that petty fears and petty pleasures are but the shadow of the reality. Henry David Thoreau. So while Gontrov and Andre are having their little what are we gonna do about King Duncan conversation in the parlor, Goncharov's Lana Del Rey born to die wife Katya is in the other room and she is playing the piano. She is stress playing the piano. If you know, you know. She is desperately trying to drown out the conversation that they are having for plausible deniability, right? She wants to pretend that she has no fucking idea what her husband does for a living, right? She's pretending she can't hear and doesn't know. The only one who really has any idea what's going on in the situation is Andre. He's the only one willing to face any kind of reality. And that will continue. Katya's insistence on living in her own warped version of reality inside of her head continues when we meet her again in Nepal where she is walking with her friend, roommate, and softball teammate, Sophia. And they are picking some not at all symbolic apples. Right, so they have this like not at all 
metaphoric or symbolic conversation about Eve and Persephone. And here's the thing. The thing is, most people think that Katya is is inadvertently comparing herself to Persephone, right? They think that she is she is trapped in this marriage by a man in hell, this violent world, and that Sophia in in all of her innocence is Eve. And that is probably right, right? Like that is probably the truth of the the analysis. But that's not why we're here. You didn't come here. <laughs> to make sense. That is a great interpretation. It's probably the correct interpretation and it works perfectly well, but I have never in my life been satisfied with anything that works perfectly well. I need to struggle and so here we go. I think I think that Katya is Eve. I think that Katya is Eve and I think that she is Eve because yes, the Garden of Eden story is about Eve losing innocence, right? And gaining knowledge from this like tempt temptation thing. But it's also set in the fucking Garden of Eden. And what do we know about the Garden of Eden? That shit's great. That shit's perfect. That place is 10 out of 10 gorgeous White Lotus Resort. That place is fucking awesome. Garden of Eden is great. It's perfect. It's so perfect. It's practically a fantasy. This perfect utopia, nothing can go wrong. There is no knowledge, so there is no evil. And if there is no knowledge, then there is no acknowledgement. How's that? No, no knowledge, no acknowledgement of reality. Boom, Katya is Eve. Katya is Eve living this perfect life in this perfect make-believe world where she pretends to know nothing of the evils in the other room. She pretends that she's happy and in love. She pretends that she feels fulfilled and satisfied with everything that she has. And then here comes Sophia, like a snake with an apple offering her a taste of something more, of something real. Offering her a chance to step away from the falseness and towards authenticity. Sophia, meanwhile, is not this innocent flower, but Persephone living in reality, in the real world, creating beauty out of nothing just by existing, about to be dragged down to hell for something as fickle as love. Sophia offers Katya knowledge of what the real world is, what is real and true and genuine and authentic. And Katya offers Sophia love at a very steep and very dangerous price. And this is all in line with the film's overarching meta themology, where things like good and evil and love and hate and trust and loyalty aren't treated as just opposites of each other and aren't even treated as the things that they are, but are treated as these like morally gray representations of other things like pain and joy and honesty and dishonesty and reality and unreality. Kati says, that's the first lesson, always blame the devil for your crimes, suggesting that on some level she knows that the truth of her situation, that she sees herself as being smart and clever and outwitting the system. She hasn't been trapped by false dreams and desires. She is fighting for something. She is fighting to make something of herself. The American dream, she wants to be a self-made woman. But you can't be a self-made woman because it's 1973 and you're married to a mafia man. The danger that Katya brings Sophia into is not the violence and immorality of mafia life. It is the allure of a beautiful imprisonment in material individualism. She sells her on the American dream in Nepal. Think about that iconic, that iconic scene with the pearl necklace around Sophia's neck. A scene that is largely believed to be responsible for the later trend of male characters collaring women with expensive jewels as representations of false promises. But I digress. That scene? That scene. Like MTV's 2014 People's Choice Award nominated three season romantic comedy Faking It or My Life Up Until the Age of 20, it's gay and it's a lie. Gonsharov 1973, a big gay lie. These expensive and beautiful things that Katya has and gives to Sophia were earned through crime and deceit. They were given to her by Gontrav. What is beautiful and exciting and a genuine moment for Sophia where Katya's generosity and affection makes her feel wanted and special and beautiful for Katya is just a rebellion against the world that she has been trapped in. The world of Gontrav's beautiful jewels and expensive dinners while she is presenting these things 
to Sophia as beautiful, wonderful perks of her life, she secretly resents them because they don't really mean anything to her. They have just become reminders of the falseness in her marriage and she can't handle that because reminders of the falseness are reminders of the fact that she's living in a fiction. So she gives them away. And reality in the form of Sophia coming into contact with fiction in the form of Katya can only last for so long. Right. And after one beautiful, though very tense dinner with Gontrav and Andre, for which the girls in all of their ADHD glory are 20 minutes late for, we see the truth come out. The whole thing is very tense and it's very awkward. And how could it not be when your wife brings her girlfriend to dinner with your boyfriend? That is not my ideal dinner date. Unless I know about it beforehand, obviously. Anyway, it's clear that Gontrav recognizes the necklace, but he says nothing because he knows that to confront Katya about her growing relationship with Sophia would be to call into question their own relationship. Something neither of them are willing to acknowledge is crumbling before their eyes like a Nutrigrain bar. They prefer to continue dancing and attending dinners and sleeping beside each other under the pretense of love and commitment and family because that's what they were promised when they started this whole damn thing. This concept of family in mafia films is very important and Gontrav is another example of twisting that slightly on its head because Gontrav doesn't have any fucking family. His brother's dead, he's lonely and sad. Katya is his only family. Yet he has powered through to the top. He values self-reliance and independence. His individualism has served him well to get him to this point, but it has also left him suspicious and emotionally unavailable to those around him, which inevitably leads to his own downfall because it makes him very, very easy to betray. There is a scene that comes late in the film when Katya is fully, fully disillusioned by her marriage completely at this point because eating pussy is so much better. And in her like June 2020 foray into queerness, she confronts Andre and she tells him that if Gontrav loves him, it's only because he hasn't found a way to use him yet. And that that's all that Gontrav does is he finds people and he uses them and that love is a lie. And I want to take a moment to explore what she means by this, but first we are gonna need some dick. Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep is a 1968 sci-fi novel written by Philip K. Dick, and it takes place in a world where humans have pretty much decimated the planet Earth after a super awful war. And in that super awful war, they also developed these hella real, like very, very scarily realistic robots that are basically indistinguishable from humans. And it's super great and convenient during the war. After the war, they make them into slave people. They need slave people because everybody's going to Mars and it takes a long time. It's a whole, it's a whole thing, it doesn't really matter. Point is that humans in this world have become so individualistic, so focused on their own survival in the wake of the war that they are only able to see things for their usefulness. They, they are not able to see the beauty of the forest. They're just able to see the wood for the houses. And our main character's job is basically to like retire kill these androids on earth who aren't like playing by the rules so to speak obviously as all main characters do he starts to question things around him and he starts to question the significance and morality of his work because he starts to realize that these androids like maybe um are not as as not human as we thought they were and like maybe maybe we shouldn't just be killing them when they don't listen to us because maybe they've got thoughts and feelings and by maybe i mean they do because we programmed them to do that again it's a whole thing don't worry about it the problem is that these humans are only able to see technology for its usefulness and they are only able to see androids as artificial as made by humans and thus as tools that will serve them which is exactly what martin heidegger was worried about uh so heidegger um, we're going to talk about Heidegger. Sorry. <laughs> if you don't know why I'm apologizing, this is your obligatory, Heidegger was a Nazi, like a card carrying, like full on Heil Hitler Nazi. Like not, there was some ambiguity with, with Nietzsche because he was senile. Heidegger was not senile. Heidegger was a Nazi, um, which just blanket statement, uh, bad, Nazi bad. We know like, we do not approve. Talking about Heidegger, um, we're, but um, this is not a video essay about whether or not we can talk about philosophers who were also Nazis. That's not what the video essay is about. So we're talking about Heidegger, I'm sorry. 
anyway, Heidegger felt like technology was this thing that could provide for humanity. He thought that it was great, but also very dangerous because he thought that humans were very likely to misinterpret what technology was trying to teach us. A lot of what Heidegger writes doesn't make any sense. Apparently it's a translation thing. I just think he did a lot of drugs. Anyway, so Heidegger thought that technology could teach us something about our relationship to being with a capital B. So long as we did not misinterpret what technology was saying by being selfish dicks about it, which of course is exactly what we did. It's exactly what happened in reality. It's exactly what happened in Philip K. Dick's novel and it's exactly what happened in Gontra. Let's be clear for a minute. Philip K. Dick was not writing about Heidegger. Um, he had his own like problematic relationship with Nazism, but he wasn't writing about Heidegger. We're just applying Heidegger lens to him for no reason. When we look at Do Androids Dream through this Heidegger lens, we see that this, this usefulness first mentality for humans comes as a result of the isolation and trauma of that war. When Katya says to Andre that Gontrov just hasn't found a way to use him yet, what she's saying is that she noticed the same thing. She noticed that he has fallen into the same pattern as the humans in that novel, as we will fall into as real humans. His own trauma and isolation led him down the same path. Only these aren't robots, they're people. He can't see people for the beautiful, messy creatures that they are, for individuals unto themselves. He can only see them for how they may benefit his own desperate pursuit of power, which is what he believes to be the pursuit of happiness. The individualist dream of the self-made man and the allure of absolute power functions for Gontrov the same way that technology does for Heidegger. As a false pretense that leads man to seeing the world as nothing but things in man's construct. Seeing things only for their ability to be valuable and useful to us and then suddenly man is only encountering himself at every turn because everything is just made by and for him with no value of its own. And Katya fell into the same trap. She is using Sophia. She is dressing her up and bringing her into her world because she makes her feel something. But Sophia, because she is real, she's not living in that fictional world. She sees right through what Katya is doing. She sees through her pretenses. And even though she comes from nothing and is stoked to have all these like nice things and this, this, this eye-opening experience, she's no strangers to the harsh realities of the world. And despite being pretty womaned by Katya, she looks at her and she says, Lovely earrings. Did he get them for you too? I wonder how many names were scratched for you to look this lovely. I bet you don't even know yourself. I bet you close your eyes pretending it's not real. But aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of living this life? The real hell that Katya dragged Sophia into was not the violence, it's the solipsism, it's the individualism, the selfishness, the insistence on living a beautiful life in the hopes that one day it can make you feel real, but it doesn't and it can't. In a brazen flaunting of her relationship with Sophia in front of Gontrov, Katya brings Sophia onto their boat with Gontrov, and they end up in this very, very sexy arm wrestling scenario. Um, anyway, she says, so you know this isn't how our time ends. And Sophia literally throws Katya overboard and holds her head underwater and tries to drown her. She tries to drown her on her own boat in front of her mafia husband, Sophia does not give a fuck. And this scene has a lot of implications for a lot of things, but mostly I wanna focus on how this scene acts as a catalyst for Katya to shatter her own illusion. Time is but the stream I go a fishing in. I drink at it, but while I drink, I see the sandy bottom and detect the shallow it is. Its thin current slides away, but eternity remains. Henry David Thoreau. Okay, so we're gonna talk about time for a minute and it's gonna get a little wonky. <laughs> But hang in there. If it doesn't make sense, just pretend that it does because I'm pretty sure that that is what Heidegger was doing. Anyway, apparently it's a translation thing and Heidegger just doesn't make sense in English. Either that or we are living in the most egregious emperor's new clothes academia by the gaslight scenario that ever was. So pick your poison, I guess. Anyway, in a gross oversimplification of Heidegger's opinions on time, one that would get me stripped of a PhD if I had one, basically, we experience time and thus existence 
only because we are aware of its finitude, because we know that we are going to die, we experience movement towards that death. And when we experience and understand that, only then are we able to live authentically. So we're going to capitalize authentically at this point because we're, we're using like the, the philosophy, the Heidegger authentic, uh, which is less like protein deficient mom trying to convince you that smallpox isn't real and more like holding Caulfield shooting spitballs from a tree. Does that make sense? Anyway, Katya is living inauthentically. She is living in her fantasy world by drowning out the realities with music and pretty things, by cutting off her own possibilities and narrowing her horizons. According to Heidegger, authenticity comes when one accepts the responsibility of existence, when one adopts the possibilities to make their life meaningful. Inauthenticity is simply defining oneself by the average social roles and not actively choosing possibilities in the face of death. When Katya realizes that Sophia could very well drown her, on that boat, in front of Gontrov, and Gontrov probably wouldn't care, she can't ignore the harsh unrealities of her marriage anymore. She is forced to confront Sophia as more than an exciting way to rebel against her prisonous marriage. She is forced to see her as an active player in the world, as an individual herself. She is forced to accept responsibility for her own existence, which she does by stopping fighting. Stopping fighting? Stop when when she stops fighting, which she does when she stops fighting. And we see this confrontation. We see this confrontation because she suddenly stops fighting, like physically, she sla and she just lets her arms go slack. She still holds the boat, but she stops fighting. And we get this moment where it like zooms in on her watch, her clicking watch, and we just hear her heartbeat and her watch. And then like the mildly sadistic director of a scared straight program two towns over, Sophia, releases her almost as if she was waiting for that moment the whole time and the film calls back to this moment later when Katya and Sophia are lying together post coitally and Katya tells her that she is like counting down the seconds until she has to leave her again because she doesn't want to leave Sophia and go back to her her fake miserable life and Sophia says then hear only the silence in between them Katya let our love exist in the quiet of every second even when we are apart like a heart. Time is pretty much a character in the film. It is constantly present. It is something that is always looming, drawing closer and closer before like running away. Even the cinematography and the editing style go out of their way to play with the audience's sense of time, speeding up and cutting through days at a time in like a minute's worth of screen time and then spreading 10 seconds over two, three minutes of screen time. It's like Whiplash, right? Where an ambitious young jazz drummer in the pursuit of rising to the top of his elite music conservatory whose passion and to achieve perfection, wait, what? During the infamous clock tower scene where Gontrov is unable to shoot Andre and instead aims his gun at a nearby clock tower, Andre tells him, time is something you can't stop, Gontrov. Implying that the characters themselves are hyper aware of time as something that is outside of their control, something other. And that is something that Gontrov cannot handle. He can't see the beauty in the ticking clock or the silence in the seconds between. He can't see the value in an inevitable death because he sees the world through his self-reliant individualistic lens. Time isn't useful to him because he can't control it and he doesn't understand it. So he refuses to acknowledge it. He assumes that the grandfather clock in Andre's study is a few minutes off because he refuses to acknowledge that he might just be a few minutes late. Andre was right, and like Icarus, he flies too close to the clock tower, ticks too close to the tox, shoots too close to the shit. And later, when Katya is ostensibly like saying her goodbyes to Gontrov, having killed her enemies and faked her death, setting out on a new path away from the violence that has followed her her whole life, he asks her why she didn't shoot him when she had the chance. And she says, because we were in love. And he responds with, if we were really in love, you wouldn't have missed. <sighs> Which I don't think about every day of my fucking life. And it hit so hard writing this essay too because I came across a Henry David Thoreau quote where he says, in the long run, we only hit what we aim at. Anyway, Gontrov should have shot Andre right then and there at the clock tower, but he didn't. Instead, he trusted a man who he couldn't give himself to fully. A man he knew wanted more than he was ever going to be willing to give. He trusted that man to be loyal because that's what he wanted. That's how he thinks it should be. 
and he thinks that he can bend the world to his whim. He trusts his own gut too much. He's so blind to other people's autonomy that he lets Andre go, not out of love, but out of hubris. Which makes it all more painful when, moments later, Andre shows up and shoots him point blank on the dock, and he dies alone to the sound of a ticking clock. Sophia survives, though, co-opting the material idealist lifestyle that Katya had shown her by stealing Katya's boat. The same boat that Paolo, the guy that Katya thought she killed, it's a whole thing, we didn't get into it, but he is hiding on having not died. Um, <laughs> very much survived. He is hiding on this boat when Sophia steals it and they run out of Nepal. Ironically, this new authentic life that Katya sets out to build is, is also being built on an illusion. And her decision not to tell Sophia what she was doing or where she was going leads us to wonder whether or not she learned her lesson in the first place. After all, it is the knowledge that death is inevitable that pushed her to live this authentic, genuine life in the first place. So if that's the case, what does it mean then for her to live beyond her own death? Did she really break free of her false reality or did she just create a new one? Can you build something real out of something made up? 